Today we're going to talk about tic disorders and comorbid conditions by me, uh, Maya, and Romy here. And I have some of our Instagram tags and YouTube tags down at the, bo at the bottom here. Um, if you guys would like to um, follow us and stuff, if you have any questions, <coughs> us an email or anything. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're just going to do some introductions first. So I'm Logan. I'm 16. I'm from British Columbia, Canada. And today I'm going to be talking about psychology of tics, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, bipolar disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, and learning disorders. All right, Maya, you can go next. Um, hi, I'm Maya. I'm 14. I'm from Maryland. And I'm going to be talking about the types of tic disorders, triggers, premature urges, and tic depression, tic tacs, rage attacks. Uh, sensory processing disorder respond to text, more conditions and um, My name is Romy. I'm from Buckinghamshire in England, UK, and today I'm going to be talking about the psychology and neurology of tics, types of tics, obsessive compulsive disorders, types of OCD, pandas and pan syndrome, and autism spectrum disorders. Alright, so first I just got a say a little disclaimer here. Um, so the mental health information provided in this webinar is strictly for general information and educational purposes only, and is not a substitute for professional advice. Accordingly, before taking any actions based upon such information, we encourage you to consult with the appropriate, appropriate professionals. We do not provide any individualized mental health advice during this time. This webinar may contain an individual, individual's experiences and opinions of such users. We do not claim, and you should not assume, that all users will have the same experience. These experiences are not intended, nor should be, they should be construed as claims that our webinar can be used to diagnose, treat, mitigate, cure, prevent, or otherwise be used for any disease or medical condition. Um, obscene movements, words, or phrases may be involuntarily used during this session, known as tics. We encourage you to, we encourage and ask you to appropriately and respectfully react to such actions. Involuntary actions may include swearing, inappropriate gestures, seizure-like movements, involuntary paralysis, unusable limbs, vocalizations in which are the opposite of an individual's true intentions, fidgeting, impulsiveness, respiratory failure, eliminations, jumping, falling, etc. And there's going to be two parts to this session. So there's going to be the presentation part, and then there's going to be a kind of just a hanging out part at the end. Um, and that is totally up to you whether or not you would like to attend for the last bit. Uh, so yeah. So why is this webinar important? So first of all, I wanted to talk about and explain like one in five people are said to have a mental disorder sometime in their life. And it's great to have mental health awareness for these types of topics as they can be extremely stigmatized. And we do this to decrease the stigmatism for these highly stigmatized disorders. And it helps open doors for those that have these disorders, for those, for the people that are there to support them, to help them through these difficulties and to be there to support them and understand what is happening. And it's important to catch these disorders as soon as possible because it um, may, introduce more conditions that people will um, develop over their lifetime. <coughs> All right, so we're going to move over to Maya for a second here, and she's going to talk about types of tic disorders. Uh, OK, so um, there are three, three main types of tic disorders. The first is Tourette syndrome, which is where both multiple motor and vocal tics have been present at some time during, uh, for over one year of time. And the uh, tics have been present for over a year and you must be, it must have started before you are 18 years old. And then there is chronic motor or vocal tic disorder, which is where you have either um, motor or vocal tics for more than one year and is present for you when you're 18. Or you could have provisional tic disorder, which is where you could have 
motor and or vocal tics, but they're present for less than one year. We did I have more. Uh, I think that's okay. And then we Romy is going to do this more. slide. So um, the psychology and neurology behind tics. So the first one is neurology, which is um, Tourette syndrome and tic disorders may result from a neurodevelopmental difference or abnormality within the basal ganglia, which is a set of brain nuclei controlling motor and cognitive processes. And it's hypothesized that these um, differences lead to a decrease in activity in either the stratopolitical connections or the subthalamic political connections within the indirect pathway. And this may result in a reduced output from the basal ganglia and a disinhibition of the thalamic cortical circuitry in Tourette syndrome patients. And Tourette syndrome can also be genetic. So it can be passed down through families and it, it you'll often find family members with, um, families with multiple people with a condition and some people may have traits. So um, the exact cause isn't fully known, but they have identified some specific genetic changes and mutations and brain chemistry also seems to be important. Um, especially the brain chemicals glutamate, serotonin, and dopamine. And some evidence also suggests some inflammation, as some people with threats have been found to have high levels of inflammatory cytokines. And number three is um, conversion disorder, which is uh, one or more of the following symptoms of altered voluntary motor or sensory function and clinical findings that produce evidence of incompat incompatibility between symptoms symptoms and recognized conditions. And it's usually a complicated, severely distressing or traumatic event will happen and somebody's mind involuntarily turns emotional pain into physical symptoms. And they can include unintentional weakness or paralysis, kicks, abnormal movements such as tremors or dystonic movements, gait abnormalities, abnormal limb posturing, also produced or absent skin sensation, vision or hearing differences, abnormal generalized limb shaking with loss of consciousness that may resemble seizures, unresponsive, unresponsiveness resembling syncope or coma, reduced or absent speech volume, altered articulation or a sensation of a throat lump with no medical evidence or diagnosis. But it is important to note that this condition, the symptoms are real to the person, it's just that a physical cause isn't able to be found or identified. So it's a difference in the function. So it's also, I believe, known as functional neurologic disorder. And then the fourth is pandas and pans, which is something that we will talk about in more detail later. Thanks, Romy. Um, there's another slide for you here. So the types of tics. Um, vocal tics can um, include, they can be simple or complex, and they include anything to do with sound or the throat or the windpipe, and they can include barking, hissing, sniffing, shouting, um, snorting, yelling random phrases, making uh, noises, um, anything like that. And then motor tics are the movement tics. And they can include head jerking, um, kicking out, uh, throwing things, collapsing the floor, or anything like that. So they're just the general um, tics that they're classified into. But then it does, there are more specific categories. So there are simple tics, which are ones which are only involve one muscle group or or very subtle like throat clearing or tensing one muscle or something or blinking then there are more complex tics such as tics that look ritualistic or tics that can be observational or can have contextual meaning um coprolalia coprolalia is involuntary swearing or saying inappropriate things or using obscene language and that's said to occur um, between, in between 10 to 15 percent of people with Tourette syndrome. Um, however, it is you know highly stereotyped, but it's actually not as common as some people may think. Uh, Copopraxia is involuntary, um, involuntary uh, inappropriate gestures, and copographia is where somebody may write things that are inappropriate um, as a tick. Um, or they may draw things that are inappropriate as a tick. Um, there's 
coprospepsia, which is involuntary obscene thoughts or images, um, and that can also be linked to intrusive thoughts. There's echolalia, which is where somebody may uh, copy other people's sounds or what other people say, and then they repeat that. There's echopraxia, which is where people may copy other people's movements. Um, there's palalia, which is where people may uh, repeat themselves when speaking. Sometimes it can sound like a complex stutter, um, or they may just repeat syllables or say the same word over and over again whilst they are trying to voluntarily speak. Um, palapraxia is where <clears throat> people may repeat their own movements, and phantom tics are where people may where people may have out-of-body sensations, so they may feel the physical urge to tick projected out of their body onto an object, and that can be very distressing for some people and very confusing. Uh, sensory ticks are distressing and uncomfortable sensations that are not associated with a movement or vocalisation, they just occur on their own, but they are invisible to people around us, however they can be very, very distressing because it's a horrible feeling. Um, seizure ticks are involuntary, quick and short muscle contractions and some people are unable to speak. Uh, blocking and paralysis ticks are where people may either fall to the ground unable to move or they may lose the ability to use a certain limb um, because it's almost like it's blocked off. Impulsive ticks are the involuntary sudden urge to act in an aggressive way or to do something that may be dangerous without um, being able to take into regard the consequences. It's very sudden and can be very, very dangerous. Um, respiratory tics can include involuntary inconsistent breathing, either too fast, too slow, or not at all. And sometimes people may pass out and it can also lead to like numbness in your fingers and other um, symptoms like, like lightheadedness. There's ego dystonic tics where people may say the opposite of um, their true intentions or um, just something that's unacceptable to them personally. There's biosurface ticks, which is involuntary rubbing or feeling a surface. Um, ascend and descend ticks, which is where somebody may involuntarily stand up or sit down, they might jump or fall, some people may squat as well. There's elimination ticks, which include the involuntary elimination of either, of either one's own urine or feces, and that can sometimes occur with a stomach clenching tick, a stomach clenching tick as well. Um, some people have um, paraphilic tics, which are involuntary vocalizations or movement in a um, statistic or paralytic manner. There's cladomania, which is involuntary shouting uh, random words and phrases. And there's mind tics, also known as mental tics, where people may have tics in the mind where they have to repeat something or they have a random phrase stuck in their mind. And this one's from my app. Uh, true. Okay. So there's uh, two types of uh, tick, tri uh, tick triggers. There's internal and external triggers. Um, and so internal triggers can uh, um, include anxiety, boredom, excitement, and anger. And um, other um, external triggers can include like, sick, allergies, and fatigue, and extreme temperatures. Yeah, and an expert is going yeah. to talk about sensory processing disorder. So sensory processing disorders um, are when sensory signals do not get like organized into appropriate responses, and so it's therefore difficult to process. Um, sensory information. So, for example, for like sight, um, there may be visual patterns, like moving or spinning objects, and uh, bright objects, just bright objects or light. Um, it can be specific smells. Like some people like to smell anything. Um, they're, they're able to detect the object to smell that other people don't notice. They can hear um, and they get like, bothered by louder, unexpected sounds like fire alarms or blenders, singing, 
or repetitive or specific type noises. Um, and sometimes specific tastes and textures, like chewing and sucking on non-food objects have to do with uh, sensory processing. And then for touch, it's like touch from other people, touching and fiddling with objects or the, like different textures and surfaces, such as in clothing. Um, they, with sensory processing disorder, you either feel uh, sensory input more or less intensely than other people without the disorder. And it definitely um, impacts like interacting with different environments and stuff and how you perform daily activities. Um, so for the types of sensory processing disorders, there's sensory modulation disorder, which is a problem with turning sensory messages into controlled behaviors that match the nature and intensity of the sensory information. There is sensory-based motor disorder, which is a problem with stabilizing, moving, or planning a series of movements in response to sensory demand. And there is sensory discrimination disorder, which is a problem with sensing similarities and differences between sensations. Did I forget something? <laughs> um, this, this is your next slide. Logan, did I forget something? No, I don't think you missed anything. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, my computer's being really. Okay, my computer's being really slow. Sorry. Okay. So how to how to respond to text. Um. So just to kind of support the person with text. Um. If you like talk about a tick, it's very likely that person with the tick will start like taking that tick. Um, yeah. Um, am I still frozen? No, you're okay. Okay. Um, do not intentionally trigger a tick. Um, try to avoid a lot of stress because that um in the creases tick and sometimes it's better just not to respond um to ticks um comorbid conditions include a lot of learning disorders other neurodevelopmental disorders anxiety disorders sensory processing disorders sleep disorders depressive disorders and bipolar disorders Okay, so treatment for ticks. Um, Tourette's syndrome and other tick disorders are not curable, but there is um, there is treatment that can help mitigate the effects of the ticks. One example is uh, CBIT or another type of behavior therapy, uh, M -bit, I don't know. Um, for example, if a patient has a tick that involves head rubbing, uh, the what we call competing response as part of CBIT therapy might be for that person to cross his or her arms so that the head rubbing cannot take place. Um, there's also medication for treatment for syndrome other tick disorders. Um, antipsychotics bring down the dopamine levels. Uh, stimulants uh, are often given to ADHD patients to increase attention and concentration. Uh, there are uh, medications that help treat impulse control problems and sometimes antidepressants to relieve anxiety and depression. Uh, but those could sometimes worsen tests. Um, uh, other types of treatment include deep brain stimulation, uh, dental appliances, hobbies and passions, sensory input, nutrition psychiatry, and support and awareness. 
I'm going to be talking about obsessive compulsive disorder and the diagnostic criteria is either obsessions um, and or compulsions in which are unrealistic or obsessive and take ew, at least one hour out of a day to perform such tasks. Thank you. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, wanker. obsessions can include wanker. intrusive thoughts, fears, urges, worries, fixations, ideas, or images hey, that wanker, that cause intense anxiety and distress. And these can include ego dystonic obsessions, um, impulsive intrusive thoughts, obsessional worries or concerns, fears, wanker. Um, and you can have intrusive thoughts without having OCD because a lot of people, to be fair, everybody has intrusive thoughts, but there are other conditions that can cause people to have intrusive thoughts. And with OCD, um, people might be afraid they may act on the thoughts or they might be terrified that they may come true. That's known as magical thinking. And and there is a difference between between an obsession and a delusion. Um, with an obsession, um, we know it's um, unlikely. We know it seems ridiculous. Um, however, the anxiety is very intense, which causes us to have the compulsions. Uh, versus delusion, a delusion is a false belief. So somebody may actually genuinely believe something, whereas with an obsession, it's more of an anxiety, although that anxiety can be very, very strong. And OCD is also known as the doubting disease because it can make you doubt yourself, doubt your own intentions, doubt whether you may have harmed someone, doubt whether you turn the stove off. It makes you doubt everything. Um, some people may have an obsession with certain numbers. So they may, for example, like the number three and dislike the number four. And the rituals may involve somebody doing something a certain amount of times. Um, and some people may actually avoid certain colours or something, as it may be linked to intense superstition. They may think that certain colours are bad luck. Um, so for me, I I did do rituals to the number three. I would um, I would open and close doors uh, one two three one two three one two three. So that was my special number, but it is very different for everybody. But with OCD, it's all about finding certainty, and that's why the um, People might reassurance it because they try to find certainty as it causes intense doubts. Now, a compulsion is where somebody may attempt to ignore or suppress an intrusive thought with another thought or action, and it can be done to neutralize the feelings, reduce anxiety, or to um, reduce the fear of bad things happening if it's magical thinking. Um, as that can be quite common in individuals with obsessive compulsive disorder. But unfortunately, the problem is that the more you try to stop intrusive thoughts, the worse they can get as they are uncontrollable. Um, but the intrusive thoughts do cause so much distress to people. Um, and the compulsions may reduce the anxiety, but they can fuel a vicious cycle. But it isn't actually as simple as just stopping, as people wouldn't have OCD otherwise. But the anxiety, fear, shame, dread, and guilt and reaction to intrusive thought can be so immense. And it can be managed through therapies, but that takes patience and time. So we can feel out of control and we can't simply stop it. So it is important to have people around us who um, understand. But at the same time, therapy can help people. <laughs> Chicken nuggets! <laughs> now, <clears throat> a... There are different types of compulsions. There's um, overt and covert. And overt are compulsions that you can see on the outside, whereas covert are actually internal compulsions, so they may be mental. And covert compulsions can include rumination, which is where you may overthink something in an attempt to find certainty or in an attempt to find an answer. Um, but that can go again and again. And you can't really focus on anything going on around you at all. Some people may try and think the opposite of the intrusive thought in an attempt to neutralize it. Some people may argue with the intrusive thought, as we can have intrusive thoughts that sound like there's someone in our mind arguing with us, and we may mentally argue back. Um, some people may pray in the mind. Some people may visualize the opposite of the intrusive thought or visualize something in attempt in attempt to stop something bad from happening. Some people may count in the mind. They may repeat certain words in the mind. Um, 
people may have to try and firm over intrusive thoughts, like they may have a bad thought and might make, might try to repeat the same thing over and over and over again to try and block it out. Some people may have memory checking, which is where they try to go back to an event and figure out, did they do something bad? Is is this going to cause harm? And they try and check their memory, but the mind can play tricks and it can be very, very confusing. People may have intention checking, which is where in their mind they try and review their own intentions because OCD causes so much doubt that they might not be able to even um, be certain about their own intentions. And people may sort of ruminate in their mind trying to think, am I doing this for the right reasons? And people may also emotion check thinking, am I feeling the right way in this specific situation? Um, overt compulsions can include straightening things, hand washing and hand drying. Um, and, and the hand washing and hand drying, I know that that is your sort of stereotyped of OCD. However, it is debilitating. The hand washing can occur until an individual's hands are red and, and raw and it can take hours and hours out of somebody's day and people may not have time for anything else they may have no usable hours and no free time because they are doing these compulsions so much um some people, some people may repeat themselves because they might be they might be afraid of being misunderstood some people may rip things up a certain amount of times or, or do anything a certain amount of times um some people may open and close doors or even bang the door into the wall people may check the stove or check different things it can include tapping um avoiding stepping certain places uh, banging things repeatedly, scrolling up and down the laptop, erasing and rewriting, excessive checking of different things. Um, maybe, you know, they, somebody might check a label or a letter over and over again to make sure that they got the right information. People may seek reassurance by repeatedly asking questions such as, are they a good person? Are they loved? Or um, did they do a bad thing? People might write lists try and prove to themselves that they are not something if that's what the obsession is um some people may repeat certain words not as a tick but in an attempt to reduce the anxiety or prevent something bad from happening some people you know ocd can affect everything so but when people are trying to dress themselves they might struggle to dress themselves as they may be pulling their clothes up and down for hours and some people may need to get things just right so they might try and line things up however um it's never straight enough Now, there are a multitude of different types of OCD, and you can have multiple types at once because these are just specific obsessions that people may have and the compulsions that occur with them. So, morality and um, scrupulosity OCD is where people, um, well, it's excessive dominated thoughts of wrongdoing, sinning, being in trouble, not being good enough, and feeling constantly guilt-ridden that you'll be found out to be a liar or a cheat in some way. And it's often linked to uh, religion or, or morality, um, so doing the right thing. And people may be obsessed with being a good person. And some people uh, may have an obsession as well with following the right path. And they may be afraid to make simple decisions or do simple things in case it's the wrong thing. And they worry that that could send them down the wrong path and things uh, might might be catastrophic just because they did one thing wrong and the thinking can be incredibly rigid um like taking the ripple effect from simple actions way too literally and um that means that people can find it very very difficult to make simple decisions as they don't know whether it's the right decision <laughs> so the thinking can almost be uh, very black and white hey 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 no! it can um also lead to an obsession with the spiritual practice and people may hey people may um, have intrusive thoughts that go against their morals, values, and beliefs, um, such as involuntarily thinking disrespectful things about God or thinking horrible phrases that go against their beliefs. And people may pray excessively um, or they may um, opt out of making decisions. They may read scriptures constantly, obsessively practice gratitude, ruminate about whether they have done anything wrong and whether they have learned their lesson. That might also involve memory checking. People may in their mind, go back to an event, make sure they did the right thing, and um, people may apologise constantly as, as people feel very, very guilty. People may try to neutralise the intrusive thoughts or even have an avoidance of religious or spiritual things as they know that it will trigger the uncertainty and rumination as to whether they're doing it right. And if a person is doing something that they deem as bad or wrong, they may feel intense shame and panic, and they, they, they literally, some people may review every single action so they may, um, again, 
review every single thing they do and feel and even thought checking. So it can be debilitating to some people. Ooh. Now, <clears throat> perfectionism OCD is the literal need to seem perfect to others around you. Um, so for example, people may repeatedly check the typos to ensure that they haven't made a mistake. However, the amount of rereading can be excessive and people may have very, very intense feelings of shame. So if they make a mistake, it can feel catastrophic, like the end of the world to them. And um, it's just such an obsession. And sometimes people may, if they feel like they made a mistake, they may ruin it in their mind and their inner voice can become quite critical of themselves. And that can lead to depression sometimes as well. Chicken. Woo! People may worry so much about not doing things right that they procrastinate and avoid doing certain things at all. And um, if, if, um, if a slight mistake can send somebody into a massive spiral, so it can be debilitating and people um, might spend so much time trying to make sure that they're perfect. Now, sexuality OCD is the repeated worry or intrusive thoughts about your own sexuality, which can cause distress in function. And um, this is different to somebody wondering if they are genuinely a different sexuality. This is just the inability to find certainty, which can cause distress for some people. And some people may worry that by accidentally looking at someone's breast or something, they might think that does that mean that they're a lesbian? And people may just worry about the uncertainty about not knowing their sexuality, but their OCD causes them to doubt it. And it may make them question whether they are LGB and just LGBT and just don't know it. And people with this form of OCD may have intrusive thoughts um, about same-sex relationships, which can cause anxiety to some people. But it should not be assumed that people with this form of OCD are homophobic, as they can be very accepting of other sexuality, as we know that there is nothing wrong with being LGBT. And everybody has the right to be accepted for who they are. But people may have worries about whether they are gay and whether that will mean they have to leave their family and so on and so forth. And people in the LGBT community can also have sexuality OCD um, and they may worry about becoming straight as it could um, change their perception of themselves, for example. Relationship OCD is a form of OCD that, resolve, that revolves around the excessive um, fears around your relationship. So somebody may worry that they'll accidentally cheat on their partner, or they may worry that they are secretly in love with somebody else, or they may worry um, whether they're good enough for their partner. And this can and this can cause a lot of anxiety and people may ruminate to try and figure things out. They may journal constantly to try and figure out their own feelings as you doubt your own feelings towards the relationship. And people may read articles on relationships or compare their relationships to others to see if it is actually a good relationship for them. And this can make staying in any sort of relationship very, very difficult. Hey. <coughs> um, existential OCD is the uh, involuntary obsession with some very, very deep questions of the universe and people may have intrusive thoughts. It's not them really thinking this, but they may have constant intrusive thoughts that they feel like they need to answer because it's the fight for certainty. Um, and these questions in the mind can include what's the meaning of life and why do we have love and why do we do this? Why do we do that? But that can be incredibly distressing for some people as it feels like nothing matters. If you don't know the meaning of life and you have these constant intrusive thoughts that you have to answer and you generally feel doubt it feels like there's no point in doing anything and this can lead somebody into a deep depression and people may not see the point in doing anything because they don't know whether they're living life in the right way and people may read countless articles or watch documentaries to try and find answers to these questions and this is very very different to just wondering as we all have these questions sometimes but this is constant and can be debilitating <clears throat> and it often leads to some some form of desperation as well. People are desperate for an answer that they cannot find. Now, Tourette's OCD is actually a very distinct condition from classic OCD because Tourette's OCD, an individual doesn't actually have any obsession. So it is purely compulsive. And if you're wondering how that works, instead of fears or worries and intrusive thoughts, like in classic OCD, an individual with Tourette's OCD will have sensations similar to before a tick. But the compulsions in Tourette's OCD can look identical to those in classic OCD and can still take hours and hours out of somebody's day. Um, for example, for me, it used to take eight hours out of my day because I would open and close doors and uh, pull my clothes up and down, 
hand wash, but this is all actually sensation based. For example, I'd wash my hands because there was a sensation on them, and I also had phantom tics, which were the out of body sensations pulling me to do these rituals. So it was very complex, but different from classic OCD because CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, is effective for classic OCD, but not classic OCD, as classic OCD is not thought based, it is sensation based, therefore has to be managed in the same way as tics. And ERP for some people can make Tourette's OCD worse as it's similar to depression. Now, pure OOCD is where people have um, obsessed thoughts and intrusive thoughts, however, they don't have the outward compulsions, they have the um, covert or mental compulsions instead. So people with pure, o pure OOCD may actually be terrified of having negative thoughts as they may worry that by thinking something bad, then it may karmically make something bad happen, or they may um, just feel like a bad person. And the mental compulsions can be where somebody tries to erase the thought or apologize in their mind and the other things that we listed before. Harm OCD is a form of OCD where people may excessively worry that they have accidentally harmed someone or that they have harmed someone in the past or may harm someone in the future. And they may have in horrific, horrific intrusive thoughts of harming those they love or those they love dying or getting ill or even animals and pets it's the intrusive thoughts can be horrible because they are what somebody's most against and they may worry that they are secretly a vicious or aggressive person which they are not because it's the opposite of who you really are but they may be terrified that they'll act on impulse or be responsible for causing some sort of harm and they may um hide dangerous items from themselves such as knives or chemicals because they don't want the uncertainty as whether they'll act on it accidentally or not. Some people um, <clears throat> some people may again try to figure things out so they might look up violent criminals and offenders and see if they have anything in common and they may review every action and play out past events in their mind and also seek reassurance as to whether they may have done something wrong or caused harm. Time OCD can include an obsession with presence where people are so focused on ensuring that they are focused on the present moment, but they cannot even enjoy the present moment. And people may also worry whether they are doing things too fast or too slow, or they may worry about the uncertainty of when they will get things done. Hey, hey, hey. <clears throat> people may also worry that they may be wasting time. <clears throat> Checking OCD is a form of OCD where people may feel compelled to check things such as light switches to ensure that the light is off, or they may check that the stove is off, or um, then they reread labels over and over again. However, this isn't just checking once. This is repeated, a massive cycle that doesn't really stop because it goes on and on and takes a long amount of time because there is no certainty. And people may have the mental ones as well, such as intention checking or emotion checking. Now, sensory motor OCD is the excessive awareness of bodily functions, such as breathing or blinking or swallowing, and people cannot get their awareness off of these things that most people uh, would not even be aware of, and people may be worrying whether they are breathing or blink blinking correctly. Now, hoarding OCD is where people may try to keep things due to the fear and uncertainty of whether they will be useful one day, even though it's unlikely. However, hoarding disorder is different from OCD, but people with OCD may have um, hoarding compulsions due to the fear. Now, <clears throat> emotional and mental contamination OCD can include the worry that you'll accidentally trans transmute your emotions to others, um, so other people might catch your emotions off you, and this can cause you to stay away from people or try to suppress the emotion within yourself. Um, sometimes you may worry that your thoughts are going to contaminate you, and you may feel unclean or dirty because of the thoughts that you have been having uncontrollably, and people may have the psychological feeling of dirtiness and perceive that as the contaminant. And some people may worry that by being around somebody with a certain characteristic, is that going to make them pick up that characteristic that they deem undesirable or negative? Now, germophobia, illness, and contamination OCD is where people can be utterly terrified of germs, and people may clean surfaces, they may wash their hands for hours, and um, they may try to prevent getting ill in any way that they can, and may avoid certain things because of that. People may might fear that they'll get a serious illness or an incurable disease and they may not want to touch door handles or things in the bathroom and for example people might even change their clothes if they feel like they're contaminated and people may avoid dirt and they may even worry about giving an illness to others or they may have um, 
many baths or showers in a given day. Just right OCD is a form of OCD where everything needs to be just right, which is how people pet it, but it can be the need for symmetry or having things in a certain place, evening things out, ordering things or lining things up perfectly. And things may need to be touched in a certain way as well. And sometimes, for example, when I was younger, I would spend ages with my shoes in the hallway, about 40 minutes. Every time I had to come in the house, 40 minutes, I would, be, I would try and straighten them. However, it's not as simple as just taking them straight because if it was straight, then it was too perfect. And if it was wonky, then it wasn't straight enough. Therefore, it does not let you win. Now, uh, paedophilia OCD is where people have horrific intrusive thoughts um, about being a paedophile. But it is important to know, again, that just like all intrusive thoughts, these are ego dystonic. So they are what the person is most against. Um, the difference, obviously, between paedophilia and paedophilia OCD is that people who are paedophiles get joy from it. However, people with paedophilia OCD experience immense stress. And they may sensation check to see if they are feeling any sort of attraction, and they may even avoid going out in case they see a child and have those intrusive thoughts. And they may be, they may be terrified that they'll accidentally harm a child or have that sort of attraction. And that can be debilitating for some people because of the intense fear. <clears throat> These are just some of the obsessions, obsessions and compulsions that people may have, as um, everyone's different. And some interesting facts are that children or people with OCD may become aggressive or frustrated if their compulsions are thwarted or if they're told not to do them because the anxiety can accumulate and cause a lot of fear and distress. OCD is said to be a lifelong disorder, but some people can go into a recovery with treatment and can use techniques, techniques to prevent relapse. And it is vital that there is awareness of OCD so that people know what they're going through and that they are not alone because a lot of people live for years with intrusive thoughts without seeking help. But there are others out there who understand and it is actually a condition. And it's also important again to break down the stigma because a lot of people see OCD as a quirk or a personality trait when in fact it's a mental illness that in some cases can be debilitating and cause a lot of anxiety and take hours out of your day. Um, some people with OCD may it may feel like your thoughts are, are a reality, even though you know they're not. But it can be terrifying because you're worried that they might be real. Um, and it's important to know that we are not our thoughts, and we don't actually control our thoughts. But OCD has been associated with inflammation in the brain, not just with pandas and pans induced cases, but a study that was published online in JAMA Psychiatry found that brain inflammation was approximately 32% higher in people with, with OCD than without the condition. <clears throat> All right, um, we're just going to um, hurry this up a little bit, Romy, if that's OK. Yeah, <laughs> I need to talk. <laughs> I'll say that, OK. I'm just going to stop reading that because that's too long. Um, let's start with this. So, pandas and pans. Pandas and pans are autoimmune conditions where people may <clears throat> they're released an attack part of the brain called the basal ganglia, and the criteria is an abrupt onset of severe OCD or and or food restriction with symptoms from at least two other categories, and that includes eating disorders where people may struggle with anorexia or they may worry about um, their weight or they may have the fear of choking. Some people may have anxiety, usually separation anxiety, but it can also show up as generalized and panic attacks and social anxiety. Some people have emotional lability, which is where they may have mood swings, uh, even manic episodes. <laughs> and um, some people can have um, like rage and stuff as well, and may involuntarily start laughing. And, and yes, I, I thought that, yes, I have been doing a lot. It's quite true. It's because I was reading off there, now I'm just summarizing it. But um, yes, also, um, depression can be a symptom of pandas and pans, and this can come on again overnight like the other symptoms, and it can be um, very um, very shocking to the people around somebody because the most optimistic person can suddenly become severely depressed. And also, agitation, irritability, and oppositional behavior can be a symptom. So people may appear as if they have oppositional defiance disorder. People may... Um, find that everything around them annoys them or may have meltdowns and rage attacks. Some people have behavioral and developmental regression where they <clears throat> have a deterioration in, in their learning abilities and may act younger than they actually are. Um, and some people have sensory and motor abnormalities, which can include tics, 
loss of sensation, <clears throat> uh, loss of coordination, balance issues, um, hallucinations, and other things. And some people have somatic signs such as sleep issues, which can include insomnia, and <clears throat> and um, it can also include REM behaviour disorder and uh, night terrors and many people also have an increase in urinary frequency and some people also have a uh, catatonic state where they may be unresponsive to things around them. Chicken! <laughs> hey! Now, <clears throat> pandas and pans can run in families. Um, However, it is, because it's autoimmune, often triggered by infectious agents such as strep in pandas, but also Lyme disease, mononucleosis, the common cold, influenza, um, and other things in pans. And those other factors can include trauma, psychosocial stress, food sensitivities, and mold and metabolic disturbances. It is uh, also as rheumatic fever of the brain as rheumatic fever is caused by stress. Now, um, some statistics I'll go through um, quickly. It's estimated that 25% of people diagnosed with Tourette syndrome or OCD actually have pandas or pans. However, it is often misdiagnosed and 70% of people with pandas and pans um, often uh, develop tics. 25% of people with pandas and pans can experience psychosis and the abrupt onset is usually between 24 and 48 hours and people can change completely in that time. In, a, um, in the Pandas Pans UK parent survey, 35% of children had more than six months off school due to the condition, and 8.6% of the families had a financial impact over £100,000 to try and get an accurate diagnosis and effective treatment. 90% said that their paediatrician knew of the condition but considered it controversial, and 31% of parents have been referred to parenting classes due to the misunderstanding around it. Um, the, the National Institute of Mental Health has actually lifted, lifted the age restriction for PANS due to the fact that um, you can have the onset in adulthood and <clears throat> people who are not given treatment early on, um, the condition can become chronic and lifelong and PANS is a clinical diagnosis, so it's diagnosed by a checklist and antibiotic treatment can, according to Dr. Suzanne Swedo, antibiotic treatment can reduce around 25 to 30% of childhood mental illnesses. Now, <clears throat> autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder where people can have issues with social interaction, social communication, and restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And um, people may have, um, they may not understand body language, they may take things very literally, they may not understand jokes or sarcasm. Um, some people may have problems um, verbally, some people are non-verbal, other people are actually highly verbal, but it can be different for everybody as a spectrum, so it's very, very different for everybody. Um, people may have difficulty understanding what to do in a specific social situation, and it you know, is often present very early on in life, and you know, it does cause distress, and many women with autism are undiagnosed, or don't get diagnosed until their later years, as it's highly mis misunderstood and people may actually mask it. Um, but women usually present with higher levels of mental health conditions and anxiety. Um, stimming is also um, self-stimulatory behavior where <clears throat> people um, may have been able to have movements and vocalizations that, re that release beta endorphins, however, it is, it is different to a tick. And people may also have sensory processing issues similar to the ones that Maya described. All right, so we're gonna move um, really quickly here because we're running out of time. Um, so we just wanted to kind of talk about a little bit of the tick disorder uh, statistics. So ticks occur in as many as one in five school-aged children at some point in time, but may not persist long enough to actually be diagnosed with a disorder. Uh, TS and other tick disorders combined are estimated to occur in more than one in a hundred, so one percent of school-aged children in the U.S., in which 50 percent are undiagnosed. Uh, the reported prevalence for those who have been diagnosed with TS is lower than the true number, most likely because the ticks often go unrecognized. TS affects all races, ethnic groups, and ages, but 
is three to four times more common in boys than in girls. And 86% have been diagnosed with at least one other psychiatric, psychiatric condition. So we're just gonna talk really quickly about um, anxiety disorders. So the difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack. Um, so panic attacks, panic attacks are unpredictable periods of intense fear over a short period of time. Um, but anxiety attacks are less severe forms of panic attacks are longer and are set off by a trigger. Um, then there's two other types um, called attack de nerves. It means attack on the nerves and it's intense emotional upset such as acute anxiety, anger, grief, screaming, crying, trembling, hot flashes, and aggressiveness. And then cal cap is dizziness, shortness of breath, palpitations, and symptoms of anxiety slash hypervigilance, which hypervigilance is a symptom in trauma-related disorders. It's kind of when you're paranoid that everybody around you um, kind of hates you and will like hurt you in some way. Separation anxiety disorder is um, characterized by excessive anxiety when separated or the thought of being separated from a loved one. Social anxiety disorder is excessive anxiety during any type of social situation. Selective mutism disorder. Children with this disorder do not initially initiate speech or respond when spoken to by others. And generalized anxiety disorder is constant and chronic worrying, nervousness, and tension during everyday events. And agoraphobia is excessive anxiety when using public transportation in open or enclosed spaces, being in a crowd or outside of home alone. And panic disorder is regularly experiencing constant panic attacks at least once every month. And you tend to panic about having another panic attack, which then leads to another panic attack. Um, and then there's specific phobia, which many people do have, which is constantly experience anxiety when faced with a specific phobia, such as spiders, um, water, darkness. But for this one, it has to be um, affecting your daily life. So just depressive mood dysregulation disorder um, is when you there's a persistent irritable mood um, and frequent temper outbursts that are disproportionate to the situation. Major depressive disorder is an overall severe and persistent low mood, profound sadness, or a sense of despair. And dysthymia is an experience, um, low mood or a less severe form of depression that lasts for at least two years. Then there's depressive specifiers. So within all of the um, disorders in this category, there are certain specifiers. Um, so there's psychotics with psychotic features, which is included with delusions and or hallucinations. Mixed features, which is an elevated state yet does not meet criteria for a hypomanic or manic episode, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And Milan, that word, <laughs> features um, almost completely lost the ability to experience pleasure, and it's usually worse in the mornings. And an with anxious distress is persistent anxiety, yes, uh, but does not meet criteria for an additional anxiety disorder. Atypical features means that they have a depressed mood um, that can be brightened in response to a positive event. Seasonal pattern means that it only appears during a specific time of the year and, remission, and fully remissions after that season. And then catatonia, which is um, what Romy talked about a little bit before, uh, which is when you have an abnormal state of unresponsiveness to the in external environment. Um, and then we're going to skip that one. So bipolar disorders. So there are three main types of bipolar disorders, um, which is characterized by three different types of um, mood episodes. So the depressive episode, which is when you're depressed. And then there's manic episode, which is the complete opposite of that. So there's an elated or energetic state of consciousness. And then there's a hypomanic episode, which is kind of in the middle um, of a manic episode and a normal thing. So the chart on the side here just talks about um, like bipolar one disorder is when you have a, when you meet criteria for a manic episode, and then you also meet criteria for a depressive episode. And then bipolar two disorder is when you meet a um, criteria for a depressed depressed episode but do not meet criteria for a hypomanic episode or a mania uh, manic episode and then cytoclimic disorder is when you have at least two year two years of onset one year for 18 and below and are present for at least half the time and not been without symptoms for more than two months at a time and this is when you don't make criteria for a depressive episode and you don't make criteria for a manic episode but your mood is still 
kind of going up and down all the time. And the main difference between bipolar disorders and borderline personality disorder is that borderline um, personality disorders are characterized by the these episodes. So these episodes go weekly. So there's so you have like a depressive episode for two weeks, and then you have a manic episode for one week. But then borderline personality disorders are more characterized by super frequent mood changes. So it's every like either minutes or hours or days where they shift to those um, different episodes. And then we'll talk really quickly about neurodevelopmental, neurodevelopmental disorders. So there's ADHD, which is a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. Inattention means that um, this may manifest as, the, as a persistent failure to give close attention to details or focus or concentrate on different tasks. And hyperactivity slash impulsivity is like fidgeting, having to leave your seat at all, like, at all times and always have to be moving. And there's learning disorders. So there's three types of learning disorders. Dyslexia is the most well-known one, which is when you are right, uh, reading. So you have problems with reading. Dysgraphia is when you have difficulties with writing. And then dyscalculia is when you have difficulties with math. We're going to open up the floor to any final thoughts or questions. Um, and I wanted to quickly say that I know this was super long. And I'm sorry that it was super long. We kind of um, overdid it a little bit. But for the next yeah. three other sessions that we'll do in the future, we'll try and keep it short and keep the presentation for like 15 to 20 minutes. And then for the rest of the time, we'll have like a conversation and talk about it and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah. If you guys have any questions or thoughts, feel free to either um, ask it in the chat or, yeah.